Hey, good morning again, everybody. I'm Pastor Ken, the senior pastor here at Vertical Church. Welcome. Thank you all for being a part of today's celebration. And thank you all for those that are tuning in online to watch us, to be a part of what God's doing. It's such an honor for you to take time out of your important and busy days to be a part of what God is doing here at Vertical Church. We would love to see you one of these days face to face. Well, guys, I am pumped. I am lit. I am so excited about what we're going to be studying together. This is huge. This is what we're calling an alignment series. In fact, if you're not a part of a group yet, we hope you are. We hope you will get in on one. We hope there's an opportunity today. You can go on your, you can use your, 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 your mobile device. You can go out there. You can meet some people. We want you to be a part of it because we want you around the, the table talking about it. We want you interacting together because this is huge. This is awesome. Can you tell I'm excited? I really am. I'm ex- I, am, I am lit. This is awesome, okay? You all laughing at me. It's like, yeah, I am, okay? Because truth of the matter is this. In fact, I have this in my hand because a lot of times I tell you resources. If you want to study a little deeper on something, this book is one resource I can encourage you about. We have it in our bookstore. It's like Life in Community. Whether you realize it or not, in community there's room for you and I. Whether you realize what that means or not, okay. It's a corny joke, but listen, here's the scoop. I'm, I'm excited because today the series is titled Cornania. It is the community that love forms. But today is an introduction. So let me start off in this way. Here's a word, okay? Loneliness. Ooh, that's a heavy word. And every one of us have felt it, but yet at the same time, very, people don't want to admit it. Why? Because inside of us, there is a longing for human connection. There is a desire to have meaningful relationships in our lives. But yet at the same time, it can seem so difficult. It can seem so elusive. It can be like Ponce de Leon's Fountain of Youth. It can be like El Dorado, the city of gold. We ask, is this possible? Is it a figment of our imagination? Is it just a dream? Is it something that's unattainable? Because why we say we want connection, here are some disturbing statistics about the disconnection in the U.S. These come out of Duke University and the U.S. Census Bureau. Here are the disturbing statistics on the U.S. about disconnection. Number one, 27.2 million people live alone in our culture right now. 27.2 million people live alone. More people say they feel alone than in any other time in U.S. history. Isn't that fascinating? 25% of people say they have no one they can turn to as a confidant. Stop for a moment. Do you realize that's one in four people say they have nobody that they feel they can talk to when they need someone desperately to confide in? That's sad. It also, more people link their depression to loneliness. Depression is an epidemic that's being suffered, that's suffered under our culture today. We're taking drugs, we're doing all sorts of things about it, but yet it's linked to loneliness. And here are this, the number of socially isolated Americans has doubled since 1985. That's staggering. That is staggering. So loneliness and isolation is a challenge. That's something we are, we are struggling under in these ends. And what? All of us have this, this, this desire inside of us, but there's this, this dichotomy. There's this uniqueness. Because at the time, we say we want relationships. In the same way we say we want connection, we find ourselves so difficult to find that end of it. Because here's a fact about society. We're more connected than in any generation. Because of technology, because of social media, the convenience of connection is at our fingertips. But at the same time, because we can, we can uh, um, text, we can tweet, we can chat, we can I, I am, we can, we, can, we can Facebook, we can do all this stuff, right? But yet at the same time, we're more lonely than any generation in human history. Because nothing is a substitute to true, genuine, authentic human connection. In essence, we struggle under these fronts. Because the answer is just not being around people. Because some of the loneliest people live in cities where they're around lots of people. But what we discover is this proximity doesn't equal 
community. And it's no different in the church. Just because you're around a lot of people doesn't mean you're connected. Just because you're here today and people are sitting next to you doesn't mean you have meaningful Christian relationships. And we come into the church, we can't just become comfortable sitting in rows. We have to learn to become comfortable to sit in circles, to truly get to know one another. But you have to fight the trends because there's been a trend in the U.S. that's been going on for years, okay? Whereas we used to build porches on the front of houses, not for decoration. Yeah, literally, you can go back in history and discover that people used to sit on their porch and talk to their neighbors. They used to actually know what their neighbors' kids' names were. They used to have meaningful relationships with other people that they lived around. Now, we put the porch on the back of the house. Now, we come home from work, we close our doors, we shut our garages, and we sit around and watch TV and attempt to build a pseudo sense of community, but TV doesn't foster true connection. It doesn't foster the opportunity for community. But our TV watching does defy something about us. It shows the tension that exists in human beings. Because again, the longing of the human heart is for connection. The longing of the human heart is for the meaningful, real and genuine relationships. And in our TV watching, why would I say that? Because for the last three decades, the top rated shows are shows like Friends, where, you know, Joey and Monica and, and Chandler and all these people are hanging out. Now, I've never danced around in a fountain, but we dong for what they seem to have that seems real, but we don't experience. Or shows like, like Parks and Rec, or shows like even The Office. There's a sense of community that people have. Or Seinfeld, because even if you're weird and you don't know what life's about, you still can have peeps, you can still have relationships with others. But again... In the 80s, the top show of the 80s was a show called Cheers. Anybody remember that? It was about a bar, but guess what? The, what was the song that, that, that was the theme song of the show? Everybody wants to go somewhere where people know your name, right? It wasn't just words, lyrics of a song. It was the cry of a culture because we are starved for human relationships. We really desire something that we don't seem to find, that we don't seem to, to come upon, and, it is, and it's something in us. And we also, we live in the West, and Western culture is fiercely independent. And it works against that end because Western cult culture promotes isolationism. In other words, it's about individualism. It's all about me. It's about my pursuits, it's about what I'm doing, my career, what I'm after, all the rest of that. But yet, what is it we value most? What is it that Western culture fights for, longs for, fights and, and holds to? Is it one of the top values of culture? Privacy? But see, these are not biblical values. And there's where the war, there's where the tension is inside of us. Because at the same time that we want meaningful relationships, where we want to find connection with others, we fight to retain our own protectionism. Our, we, 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 we build walls around ourselves because we're scared. Why do we want privacy so much? Because we're afraid that if anybody really knew they might not want us. They might not want to connect with us. So we fight for privacy and we have this, this dichotomy between the desire for community and the desire after individualism and privacy. And we find this, that we're, we're as we say we want and desire desperately transparent relationships, we struggle. Why don't we see them? Because we're scared. We're afraid. If we ever truly open up, People might hurt me. And so we work hard at defending ourselves. We work hard at building barriers around ourselves because we're scared. We don't want to be rejected. We don't want to be hurt. And I get the struggle, trust me. Personally, I have battled this all my life. Because why? I have felt alone. Because the people who should have loved me in life were the people that tended to hurt me the most. But I know it's not biblical. I know it's not true. So I've had to work towards God. I know I need community because when, you're, when you are fiercely independent, you think, well, nobody else cares. I just need to do it for myself. And therefore, what you can do is 
cut yourself off from what God is wanting to do. We have to be willing because you know what? People drag that into the church. People come into church with a sense of fierce independence. And they have this idea, this mantra. It's just me and Jesus because Jesus met us in our brokenness. We found someone that loved us like no one else had ever loved us. And we like, yes, all I need is Jesus. And they say, Pastor, just tell me what the Bible says because it's just me and Jesus. But honestly, that is not biblical at all. Yes, we come to Jesus as individuals. But the very first thing that Jesus does is that he places us into community. We become a part of the body of Christ. We have to form interdependent relationships. In other words, not neediness where you cling and draw and suck the life out of other people, but where we learn to give and receive. We learn to be a community that's interdependent because we desperately need and understand that what God, because listen to me, if you've ever been in that state of fierce independence and you're just like, ah, it's just me and Jesus, which you'll have to be honest. I mean, we are in church. You can't confess. We are in church. Is that that leads to disillusionment. It leads to disenchantment, and it truly leaves us empty. Why? Because we're asking God to do something for us, to fill us, to do something that he designed to happen within community. So when we cut ourselves up from other people, we actually miss what God is wanting to do in us because God does his best work through people. That's what the New Testament provides us with understanding. That's why this is huge. And therefore, it's important that we see, because why? God put inside every single human being a desire, a yearning, a longing for community, for connection. You see, there is a God-given appetite that longs for authentic, real, and genuine relationships. See, all of us, if we're honest, we desperately want to be fully known and fully loved. I mean, why do we embrace the song, Fully Known? Because it, it is the hard cry of something we're desperate for, but we don't know where to find. And so God has an answer. Because it goes back, it goes back to our origin. See, God made mankind to be like him. That's what it means to be made in the image and the likeness of God. And when God created man, he made man, listen to me, to live life with other people. Because in creation, God said only one thing that he created was not good. Does anybody remember what that was? God said it's not good that humans would be alone. God never intended us to be alone. Because if we're going to be like God, let me tell you something. God is community. Now, you may never have thought that. But listen to me. When you say God, what are you talking? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God has and forever will live in community. And God created man to live in the community of the Trinity and in community with one another. Our connection with God makes it possible to be connected to one another. But when sin entered the picture, what was the very first effects it had upon the human condition? The very first thing humans did when sin entered the picture was they ran, they hid, they covered up. They hid from God. They covered up situations and they did it from one another. The very first thing sin did was impact relationships because sin breeds selfishness. Sin breeds rebellion. And those things alienate love relationships. See, love relationships, God understood it would take love for people to live in harmony together. But when we allow that situation to come in, what happens is this, we hide, we're afraid, we're scared. That's what mankind did and we've been hiding ever since. Some of you are master hiders. You're sitting here today, but you're like, man, I'm not letting anybody in. I'm going to sit, I'm, I'm pleasure to sit in the crowd, but I'm not. No, but here's the point. Perfect love drives out fear. God does not give you a spirit of fear. See, fear is the opposite of love. Because why? Love is transparent. Mankind was, was to experience transparency and affirmation. 
When it said that he made them naked and unashamed, it wasn't talking about no clothes. He said there was nothing to hide. Because when you live in love, you have nothing to hide. You do what for others is best. You don't look to your own interests, but to the interests of others around you. You are not in it for what I can get. You're in it for what I can give. And that is a radical differential. But you see, when man sinned, sin alienated him from God because God is love. When you embrace those ends, it's everything that's opposed to God. And it affected our relationship with God and affected our relationships with one another. But God had a dream. God's dream was to reunite mankind with himself and by doing so, reunite mankind with one another. Hence, why Jesus showed up. He was love incarnate. He was love amplified. Jesus' love wasn't just displayed in his sacrifice at the cross. Do you know at the moment that Jesus was willing to leave heaven and take upon himself the form of a human, he was willing to submit himself to limitations of a human body, the limitations of needs and desires, the ability to even be tempted like you and I are. Jesus showed love because he was willing to become just like us to make a way for us because God knew the only way to reconcile relationships was through love and the only way to keep the unity of this together was through love and that's what Jesus ultimately gave his life to accomplish because when we became reconciled to God through Christ because he did so by grace because none of us deserved it when we come face to face with our own rebellion, with our own sin, and we become overwhelmed by the love of God, that God would love me and make a way for me. How? By Jesus laying down his life, giving himself for me so that I could find a way back to God. I could be reconciled to God. It is that love that then gives us the ability to love one another. God had to accomplish it in that end. And that's why this all comes down to what I'm going to talk about in this series. We're going to talk about this for eight weeks, but this is about koinonia. Because if you're taking notes with me, listen, listen, listen. This is so critical. Koinonia is God's vision of community formed by love. God's vision of a community formed by love. The definition of koinonia is in your notes, and it's hard because it's a Greek word. That when translated into English, it's used 18 times in the New Testament. It is one of the most significant words of the entire New Testament. It's why we're taking eight weeks to not only walk this out, to study it and talk about it, because it's a challenge to you and I to live up to the potential of what God designed us to live for. And koinonia, when it's translated in English, can mean partnership, participation, social intercourse, benefaction, communication, Communion, contribution, distribution, fellowship. But those words seem so often to fall short. See, the origin of the word comes from the Greek word koine. Word koine means common. Something that people have in common. Koine. Okay? And when Greek philosophers envisioned the idea of a society that could live in total harmony, union, they said that would be koinonia. That would be a common unity, which where we get the word community. But yet that utopian concept never found a realization among human relationships. What frustrated Greeks was the idea that the word koinonia was never actually experienced in their communities, in their societies, until the New Testament church. When now the followers of Jesus had come together the Greeks were like, whoa, 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 koinonia, that's koinonia, because why? People that didn't know each other before, people that came from different backgrounds, people that never had anything in common before would now connect, meet one another, and they would say something like, do you know the Lord? And they're like, yeah, I know the Lord. Instantly, there was intimacy. Instantly, there was connection. Instantly, there was a love and a harmony and a community that was formed that, that defied all the barriers that culture and society had ever seen before. It defied race. 
It defied uh, gender. It defied age. It defied class. Never had it been seen that people that seemingly had nothing in common before now had a love that caused them to be united, to be, to be what the Greeks call, it's koinonia. This is what we've dreamed of. This is what what's never been realized. And the Christian community was the realization of koinonia. Let me go a little bit further. I've been studying this word for a while, so watch. Koinonia is, koinonia is, number one, it's a supernatural grace that causes Christians to love each other deeply. In other words, it's not of human origin. It comes from God. It's not something that we have. There's something, guys, go back one. I think I've skipped a, a slide. There is the difference between socializing and fellowship, koinonia. Because socializing, any two people can do. Socialization, people learn to know one another, understand one another's stories. But that doesn't cause people to stay together no matter what. Because the rubber meets the road is when, when it goes awry. And trust me, if you've been around human beings, we go awry. Because we're all broken. Okay? Do you stick together? No culture is kicking to the curb. Move on. I'm done. Okay, one and done. We're out of here. No, 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 no. Any two people can socialize, get to know one another, but only Christians can fellowship, koinonia. So what is it again? That's why it's a supernatural grace that causes Christians to love each other deeply less. It's possible because of our union, koinonia. The Bible says we have communion with Christ. The word is koinonia. When we're connected to Christ, our communion, our fellowship, our intimacy is joined us to Christ, and because we're joined to Christ, we can be joined to one another. Because there's not many Christs. Paul rebuked a carnal and immature church because he said, some of you, you say you're a Paul, some say you're of, uh, of Apollos, some say you're of Stephanus. You guys have missed it. There is only one church. There is only one Christ. You're either in or you're out. You can't divide up. That's what human nature wants to do, but that's not what Christ in you wants to do. It's Jesus that keeps us connected. And because he put the indwelling spirit in us, the Holy Spirit knits our hearts together and binds us as one. That's what God's design was. Why? Because love that transcends, that's what koinonia is. It's a love that transcends boundaries of race. Do you know, this is a shame. The church should be the answer to what ills our society. One of the horrible uh, sins that has torn human relationships apart is racism. And that should not exist in the church. But why is the church the most segregated place on Sunday morning? I'm glad vertical is not like that. Because see, love that transcends boundaries of race, gender, age, and class. It makes us feel like family. And that love for each other is from the Spirit. That's why the Bible says the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Koinonia is an essential ingredient of the New Testament church. That's why we're studying it. Koinonia is, it's a selfless immersion into each other's lives. In other words, we can't be so scared that we keep everybody at a distance. There has to be a breaking down of those walls because God intended us to be connected. It's a gathering around what we believe and then living out that belief for the whole world to see. It is a partnership a shared goal worked out side by side as a common interest. In other words, when we have fulfilled the mission of Christ, it automatically unites us as one. That's why it's not about self-agendas. All that dies. Jesus said to follow me, you have to deny yourself. You have to take up the cross. In other words, your agenda has to die. Christ's agenda has to live. It's a sharing of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's not many Holy Spirits. There's only one Holy Spirit. We're all partakers of one spirit who works as the glue that keeps us as a community of faith joined together. Koinonia, koinonia. Go to the next slide. Koinonia, Christian fellowship. Listen to this. This is challenging. Christian fellowship, fellowship, the word koinonia, is life together in the body of Christ as God intended people, transformed by the gospel of Jesus and indwelled by the Holy Spirit to live. So what does it look like? People in Christian fellowship commit to one another. 
Get, they grieve together. They sing together. They eat, pray, and play together. You're like, Pastor Ken, where in the world does that happen? That's the challenge that we have to live up to. That's why we're talking about this. This is huge. He says, they love, serve, and honor, and encourage, and provide for each other gladly, not grudgingly, or of necessity. Okay? And they live on mission together. This is how God meant for life in the local church to be experienced. Whoa! You got to be kidding. Where does that happen? Well, this is what we're committed to at Vertical. Because all of us play a part in that. All of us have a point of making this a reality. Because look, Koinonia, look at this is so important. Koinonia is the unity and fellowship of the Trinity. It's how God lives. See, it is selfless, self-giving love that promotes, gives, and seeks to please the lives for the benefit of the others and allows true harmonious unity and makes the union truly one. It is what humanity was invited into. In other words, when you look at the Trinity, why does the Bible say God is one? Because there is a selfless giving. There is a selfless promotion. You look at Jesus, he's pointing to the Father. The Father says, this is my beloved Son. Listen to him. They say, listen, don't sin against the Holy Spirit because you can be forgiven of sin against the Father and the Son. But the Holy, they all love each other. They all promote each other. They all give. Nobody has got this, this, this ego that keeps them like, no, 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 I'm the only one. No, they constantly live together, pointing to one another, serving one another, living for the benefit of one another. Therefore, they can live harmonious together as one. That's what humanity was invited into. When God created man, he invited us into the community of the Trinity, that we would learn to live with God as one and live with one another as one. That's what God's design would be. So in other words, koinonia means going from believing to belonging. That's the felt need. That's the cry of the human heart. And I want you to be, I'll be honest with you, right here at Vertical Church, there's a place for you to belong. It's not just what you believe. We want you to belong. We want you to feel welcome, to be a part of what God is doing here at Vertical. Because why? Look at the next slide. Look at this. Look at this. Oh, sorry. If you're taking note, listen. Jesus, this is the vision that God had. This is what Jesus envisioned. Okay. No, no, sorry, guys, I messed up my point. Go back to this. John 13, before Jesus was to leave and to go back to heaven, he knew his time was up. He knew his time had come. And he was about what we call the night of the Last Supper. Jesus gives the marching orders to his followers. And he replaces, this is, such, this is so powerful, it's so impactful. Jesus replaces 613 commandments with one. There's only one thing that we need to prioritize. There's only one thing we need to be committed to. Because if you commit to that one thing, it fulfills the moral requirements of all the other stuff. Jesus is the master of simplicity. It's the one thing that is not a recommendation, but it is in truth the marching orders of the followers of Jesus. And what is that? Jesus said a new what? Command. In other words, this wasn't a suggestion. This wasn't a good idea. This was the will and purpose of God. Jesus said to follow me means what? Sometimes you have to deny yourself. So in other words, this is what we are committed to. If you're a follower of Jesus, this isn't optional. This isn't like a salad bar approach to faith where you can hold the pickles and the lettuce. No, you have to take it as it's given. And Jesus said a new command I give you. Love one another. Notice he didn't stop there. Because if he said love one another, you could define love as you thought love should be. No, Jesus said love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Why? Because verse 35 said this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If, notice that's conditional, if you love one another. Stop for a moment. Is the church today defined by our love for one another? Is that what we're known most by in culture? Is that, is that how people define the members of the church, the body of Christ? Oh, those people are so loving. Those people are so genuine. No, is that it? Why are we known more for what we're against 
than what we're for. You see, this is the challenge, to live up to what Jesus expected of us. He said we were to love one another because why? That should define us to the world. Jesus prayed, listen to me. Jesus prayed this before he left the earth. He prayed, Father, make them one. As you and I are one. Why? Why was that so huge? Because then the world would know that you sent me. In other words, our ability to impact the world has everything to do with this. Because when the church is in Koinonia, when we're living as a loving community, that's when the church is most attractive. That's when the felt need, the human hunger of the soul can find the place in which we were created to live. Well, every human being experiences that design and desire for community. That's what should be attractive. We shouldn't be Blinded. We shouldn't be people that say, no, you don't belong here. Oh, no, you're into that. No, you're into that. No, Jesus came to save sinners. So people who are far away from God, I am so glad that they feel comfortable being at Vertical Church because Christ came to make himself known that you didn't have to hide. You didn't have to fake it. You didn't have to put on some religious Christian ease and pretend to be something when you walk into this place. No, the idea is authentic, genuine community where you stop trying to pretend you're something you're not. We're all broken. We're all in need. What does it unites us is that every one of us needs Christ in our lives desperately, not just yesterday, but today and forevermore. That should be it. And Jesus said this, Again, verse 34, love one another even as. No, verse 34, sorry. Lonnie said, as I have loved you. He defined it. So go to the slide, as I have. Jesus said, as I have. That's the defining mark. That's the key. Because it means follow my example. And here's the point. When did he say this? This is what we call the night of the Last Supper. In context of John 13, the Bible said Jesus, he was, the, he was the host of this dinner. It was a Passover meal. And when they came together, the Bible said Jesus knew he was about to go back to heaven. And having loved his own, he wanted to show them the full extent of his love. And something was unusual that night. I mean, nobody would speak up and say anything because the disciples, something that was very common, someone that was very absolutely any host, would make sure that this was a reality at any feast they were happening was what? The washing of your guest feet. It's like someone showing up your house and having a big coat on and you offering to take their coat and hang it up. Okay? If you don't offer that, they may sit there with their coat on and sweat their butt off. Right? Because a good host shows hospitality. And something didn't happen. And I imagine all the disciples were like, man, Jesus is not a good host. There's nobody here to wash feet. My goodness. Wow. My mama didn't raise me to be this way, but I don't want to speak up because he is my master and Lord. But man, he's got some lessons to be learned about hospitality. And yet, here it was. Jesus set it up because he had talked to his disciples multiple times about something that wasn't registering. It didn't come across to them. So he was about to brand them. He was about to do something that none of them could believe that he would actually do, that they would never, ever, ever forget. So as the dinner was going on, Jesus gets up from the meal, takes off his outer robes, which was the garment that gave him the identification of rabbi, master, the one they were following, okay? He lays all of that outer clothing aside and dons a towel and begins to wash their feet. Now that was something reserved for only slaves. That was the lowliest of the lows. And you could have heard a pin drop. Jesus? No. And every one of them were quiet until he came to Peter. And Peter had this, this you know, tendency to speak up at the wrong times. And he comes to Peter. Peter says, no, 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 Jesus. No, 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 no. Not me. Jesus said, if I don't wash you, dude, you have no part of me. And then usually like he would go overboard and say, well, then wash all of me. My hands, my head, the whole bill. He said, no, no, dude. Chill. Just let this go down. So he washes their feet, and look at what he says to them. When he finishes all that, in John 13, he said, And when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. He said, Do you understand what I've done for you? Now, he asked him a question. 
And if they were honest, they would go, no, Jesus, we don't understand what you did. In fact, we don't understand half of the stuff you tried to teach us, but we're just along for the ride. <laughs> we figure it's going to be better for us. But he's like, do you get it, guys? And he knows they don't understand. But he's provoking them to think in this regard. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. But look at verse 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. So Jesus was illustrating, listen, he had already taught them that the lessons of greatness were not what you had, and it wasn't the authority that you presented, but it was your willingness to humbly serve others out of love. The true greatness in the kingdom of God was your willingness to think nothing was beneath you, that your titles, that your prestige, that your accomplishments in life would never Carry yourself the idea that you had any air of superiority, that there was something about you that exempted you from the humblest of service. Because greatness was the willingness to humble oneself to serve the needs of others. That's the embodiment of love. That's what love is really all about. And Jesus, who is love embodied, is demonstrating for them, and they're like, whoa, if I, your servant and Lord, do this, Notice what he says next. Verse 15. I have set you a what? Example that you should do as I have done for you. Whoa. Whoa. Okay? Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master. In fact, you want to live up to my standards? That's how it is. The way up in the kingdom of God is down. When you willingly give yourself humbly to serve the needs of others, that's when you most embody Jesus to the world around us. When you think that it's beneath you, when you think that you can't, when you think that somebody else should be doing that, that it's not my job, then you have missed the train altogether. Jesus gave us the example to follow. He said, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Verse 17, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you what? Do them. It's not about knowing it. I can tell you today, some of you, I go, John 13, yeah, washing the disciples' feet. It's not what you know. It's what you actually do with what you know that embodies Jesus. Jesus was leaving this example that the community that he envisioned would be formed by a love, loving not as we think love is, but as I have loved you. That selfless, humble service that doesn't think that anything is beneath them that willingness to go out of one's way to be inconvenienced for the needs of others is the embodiment of the love of God. That's what Jesus demonstrated. And if you're taking notes, listen, listen, listen. Love lives humbly for the benefit of others. That's what Jesus was teaching us. So what was the community look like? Jesus said, I will build my church. The day the church was birthed. On the day of Pentecost, Jesus told the disciples, waiting out the door, guys, the mission that I've given you is going to require the Holy Spirit to come to you to fulfill it. And on the day of Pentecost, when now the church was in motion, when all of this, when the ecclesia is being formed, what would this community look like? The day that Peter spoke to the very people responsible for Jesus' death, the, the same crowds that cried, crucify him. Now, God was showing that, listen, this ain't about revenge or get you back. This is about a way to get you in. I love you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. You can come home. I have made the payment. I have paid the ransom. You are free because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Through Jesus, you can be restored in relationship to God. Through Jesus, you can experience grace that blows the human mind. Through Jesus, you can experience love that transforms us from the inside out. And so when that community came together, what did it look like? See, the community that love forms, the qualities of loving community, it's this. Go back, I'm sorry, go to Acts 2 and look at it. This is it, this is it. They devoted themselves. This is how this community came together. If you understand the word koinonia, it is important to recognize the significance of this text. Because this was what was modeled. This was where koinonia finds its definition, okay? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to looking 
Fellowship, it's the first, word, first time the word koinonia is introduced. And the law of first always meant the first place in which it's shown gives the significance of its meaning. And to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So what this community looked like, all of the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to everyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. In other words, in the big settings when everybody came together, and they broke bread in their homes. In other words, you have this debate in the church world. It's, oh, no, 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 no. To be like the early church, you just got to meet in houses. That's not what the scripture says. They met in the temple courts. They met in the big meeting, and they met in the homes. It's not either or. It's and and both. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. See, the church, when it's living in Koinonia, is absolutely attractive. The world wants in on that because they don't believe it's possible. And what's impossible with man is only possible through God. And you and I have this responsibility. So what does this community look like? Four things I pulled out of this real quickly as we end our time together today. Look at the qualities of loving community. Number one is personal devotion. Notice this. It said they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. In other words, no one had to run after them. No one had to chase them. No one had to coax them. No one had to persuade them. No one had to, you know, people didn't sit out and do boo-boo face. Nobody's come after me. Nobody's called me. I didn't go to church last week and nobody showed up. No, they put on their big boy pants. They took off the pampers and they grew up and said, you know what? We're in it. We're following Jesus. Nobody has to ride my back. Nobody has to chase after me. I am devoted. They devoted themselves. They were devoted to teaching. They were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to community. They were devoted to prayer. It's not one or. It's all and. And you and I, this is what personal devotion looks like. I'm all in. God, you can count on me. You don't have to chase me. I'm chasing you. That's what this is all about. Jesus, I'm so in love with you. I don't want nothing else because nothing can do me like the way you did me. I am changed because of you. I am loved in a way that I never knew love before. And there is nothing but fake pseudo situations that can't fill the human hearts like you fill me. Personal devotion. Number two, selfless generosity. In other words, because people were in all the way, they recognized God created everything. Everything comes from God. And truly everything is for God. When you are in love with God, you realize that the greatest way that love demonstrates itself, see love isn't love until you give it away. Love isn't love if you hang on to it. Love isn't love until you express it. See, love is a verb. Love is something that you do. It's not a feeling that you have. Love is the ability to say, you know what? If there's a need, I'm in. I'm willing to be a part of meeting that need. I'm not looking for somebody else. I'm looking for the opportunity to act like God because God is love. Whatever God puts on my heart, I'm not going to be scared. I'm not going to be afraid because if God is leading me to give, then God is going to provide me. I understand the paradigm that God blesses me to be a blessing. I, when I go to hoarding, when I go to holding back, fear causes me to shut down and it causes the life flow to, to dry up. But when I learn to be a river and not a reservoir, when I don't let fear keep me from doing what God is leading in my heart to do, I have confidence that God is who he said he is and generosity sets me up for the most blessed life one could ever live. They saw a need and said, you know what? If I have the ability to meet that need, God, thank you, because they did it with gladness. Thank you that you've given me the chance to act like you. You've given me the chance to be your hand, your opportunity to meet people at their point of need. Imagine if the church, see, we put off, we're wanting God to do what God intended community to do. Ooh, ouch, I've gone to meddling. Sorry. Let me back up because I've stepped on a bunch of toes. Listen to me. God blesses us. God is, God is not a tightwad. God is more than sufficient to pour out blessing. 
When we fear, we shut down the opportunity for God to do what only God can do. Selfless generosity is godly. Thirdly, listen to me. They were genuine hospitality. In other words, they weren't afraid to let people into their castles. You know, they had this expression. I don't think Latinos coined it. I think Jesus had it first. Mi casa su casa. In other words, my house is your house. Come on over because you know what? In that culture, honor is shown most when you allow people into the most private side of your life. So in other words, I'm just going to meet you at church or meet you at the restaurant or meet you somewhere else. I'm actually going to do something. I mean, this is New England. I'm, I'm really calling us out. But man, I'm actually going to allow you in to my place, my dwelling, my abode. Because there's something so powerful that it defies words. Because love is not about an expression of words. It's about honor. And you honor people when you allow them to see the most intimate. Coming to my home, wow, they weren't afraid to have people over. They weren't afraid to say, you know what, come in, because there's something that's disarming about that. There's something that's just like, man, I want you to be comfortable. I want you to be uptight. I want to show you that I love you, not just in word, but I want to show you with my life. There's something powerful about that. See, the church should be the most hospitable place on the planet, but it shouldn't end at this building. It shouldn't be just, hey, glad you're here at church. But somehow, some way, when we begin to let the walls down, when we get over fear and let love drive out fear, we willingly let. Because guess what? The people you're sitting next to probably aren't axe murderers. They're probably not going to walk out with your TV and all the rest of the stuff in your house. And they're not going to post instantly if you don't think your house measures up to house and gardens. They're just in it for relationship. And there's something authentic. There's something real when we're willing to not try to pretend, but just be who we are and allow the love of God to express through genuine hospitality. And last but not least, through compassionate care. In other words, it wasn't someone else's responsibility to take care of the people in need. It's like, God, I'm here count on me. They cared about one another. They, let, they, they went out of their way to help meet the needs of one another. They encouraged one another. They stuck with one another. See, when we begin to realize that it's in koinonia, that God advances us, God grows us, God, that's how we protect one another. That's how we survive together. When we become a loving community, that's what God designed us to be. And therefore, we need one another. There's an interdependence of relationships when we begin to walk out the paradigm of what it means. It doesn't mean we become needy peepee and cling to others and suck the life out of them. No, we give and receive. We're not always in the receiving mode. We're willing to give. We're willing to go out of our way. We're willing to lay down our lives to help be a blessing to you. And so, guys, imagine with me for a moment. If the church really looked like this, what would happen? Imagine with me for a moment. Wouldn't that be something, man, I just can't get enough of? Imagine with me, because listen to me. If the church, if koinonia happens in the church, when the church is living in community, koinonia, hearts are healed, walls come down, and outsiders come in. Imagine if we actually had the guts to take on what Jesus has challenged us to be. And be, that's, God, do you see why this is huge? Do you see why we're taking this as an alignment series? This is why we want you in community talking to others about it. I don't want you to just go, oh man, why did I come to church today? Oh my God, this is what Pastor Ken's going to be talking about for eight weeks. Oh man, wow. No, what about if we actually, because you know the answer to that isn't everybody else around you. It starts with me. In the words of the illustrious prophet Michael Jackson, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look in the mirror and start with yourself. <laughs> Sorry to all the religious people I just offended by calling Michael Jackson a prophet, but let's all bow our heads, close our eyes, and forgive your senior pastor. God bless you. Let's pray together. Father.